Was there a difference? No, there wasn't. In some, in a very real sense, it was the same gospel. However, what God gave to Paul was a full gospel. A gospel that included you and a gospel that included me. It wasn't until uh, 10 years after Pentecost that Peter was able to see this gospel. And then, of course, when Cornelius was praying, uh, the Lord observed his almsgiving and his prayers and sent a message down to Peter by way of a sheet. And through that sheet, Paul or Peter was able to learn that, yes, the Gentiles were included in this great plan. That in fact, God through faith had included all men of all nations. And it was then that the apostle Peter understood that indeed God was no respecter of persons. James, of course, came to observe this too. But Paul had this revelation from the very beginning. His, re his revelation was full. His revelation was thorough. I like to, this is the only way that I like to talk about a full gospel. I like to talk about it here because this is a full gospel. And this full gospel is not, uh, is not a narrow one. It is a gospel for everybody, that a gospel that includes all men and a gospel that can be effective in one's own life if that person has faith in God and is a follower of Jesus Christ. So there is a difference, not in, not in substance, but in, in quality. In the gospel of Jesus Christ was, had been preached to the Roman church. But Paul's experience, Paul's illumination, Paul's revelation had not been given to the Roman church. And even though the Roman letter is primarily a letter of remembrance, a letter of things uh, by way of review, still it contains uh, highlights and revelations that at that time were strictly Pauline. Remember that the, the letter to Galatians, which perhaps is the earliest letter, no, the letter to Thessalonica was the earliest letter, uh, then the letter to the Galatians, and perhaps a letter to the Corinthian church had been written, but those letters had never reached Rome. Nobody had ever seen a letter from Paul. And so when he sends the letter into Rome, they receive strength from that. They're strengthened by that. But the great strength in Paul's life was when he came to Rome in chains and was able to describe things that they'd never heard before. In fact, we're told that in order for Paul's gospel to be verified, Mark wrote the gospel of Mark, sent it into the Roman church, and there they were able to see the parallels in the gospel of Jesus Christ from those things that Paul had shared with them by letter and shared with them by day and night and shared in the letters that went out. For I am sure that while he was there, he must have shared some great passages like uh, passages... Uh, found in those letters written while in prison, some of which I read here this morning. Uh, the operation of the Spirit was, when I read from uh, Philippians 4, the operation of the Holy Spirit was on this verse right here. Those things, which he, he wrote this in prison, prison to the church at Philippi, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Now that's Paul's gospel. That's saying I'm a living book, I'm a living epistle, and what you've seen God do in me, what you've heard, what you've learned, what you've received, what you've seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul said this is given to the Roman church for their strength. So it is, it is Paul's gospel, if you please, and he dares to say so, my gospel. I think it is tremendous. I think that it's important to see that their strength it has a twofold composition, has two ingredients in this formula, if you please. It has not only a message, that's the preaching of Jesus Christ, but it has also a man or a messenger. And he said, these two things will give you strength. I think this enlightens us as to Paul's yearning and longing, for he says in the beginning of the Roman letter, he says, I long to be with you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift. 
Little we did be realized, or perhaps at the end of the letter, or perhaps after Paul's visit, that the greatest gift that he gave them was himself. In fact, God's gift to the church are the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And so, in, in effect, Paul gave him himself and gave him his revelation, for he did not learn his gospel from uh, Peter and Matthew and John. He learned his gospel from the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a gospel that was in harmony, but it was a gospel that was broader and deeper than what had given the apostles, even though they walked with the Lord Jesus. I said that he had this revelation early. If you look in Acts, you'll see he got it early indeed. In the ninth chapter of Acts, the whole, uh, Jesus is speaking to him, or he's speaking to uh, Ananias, and uh, he says here, go thy way, talking to Ananias, for Paul is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. I'm impressed with the, with the passage before. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. What a gospel this man had. See, right there, is, right there is a full gospel. Paul had the full gospel from the beginning. He's the only one that had it from the full beginning. I mean he had a full gospel. Do you see what I mean by a full gospel? Not just a Jewish, not just for the Jewish people, but a gospel for the Gentiles. That's a full gospel. A full gospel has, to more, to do, has more to do with who it includes than what it includes. Yet today we hear the term full gospel, and you've never heard me talk like this. I've never mentioned this in my life. But today I'm telling you what the full gospel is. The full gospel is not so much the spiritual gifts as it is who it includes, everyone. It's great, isn't it? It was in the, now listen to Paul's gospel. In the Colossian, well, let's go on to this next point here. I just want you to know there's two things that strengthen the Roman church. The preaching of Jesus Christ, which they already had, and Paul's gospel. He said, God has this power to make you strong and you will be strengthened with this. I think it's wonderful. I mentioned to you this morning that he also said that the children of Israel were baptized into Moses. In, indeed, the early church, especially the Gentile church, was baptized into Paul as he was in Christ Jesus. And it was in, the, in his revelation, in the light of what they saw him do, what they saw him say, and what they heard from, from him, that they were able to have the great penetration that has taken place even to this very day. Now, I wanted to, uh, to bring this point out. This is an elaboration of this morning's message, and, and uh, I just couldn't let it pass without getting back to you on it and sharing with you a little deeper insight into what had gripped me, because this is my last sharing. We're at, we're at the end of Romans. We've preached two and a half years on it, and uh, God has given us a wonderful time. I, I'm a little bit lonely that we're leaving it. I really am. I'm ready. If Jesus would say so, I'm ready to get started again. I'm ready to go back. Because when I go back through there and I see how that he tells us that in nature, in chapter 1, in nature, it, the, the nature of God is revealed. And that no, that no man has an excuse for not responding to God. Because the nature of God is seen in his handiwork. And that men deliberately turn their back on God, and having turned their back on God, something happens to them. They become perverse. They become perverted. I think it might have been enlightening to you this morning that I've recently discovered that is, it is hard. It is as hard to get a church to be normal, to have normal Christianity, as it is to get the people that who are caught in the gay society to get them out and get them into straight society. It's as difficult to get people to be normal. I learned it last Sunday morning when when I when I called on how many remembered giving themselves by vow to God in prayer to 30 minutes of prayer a day. 44 people did that more than 10 years ago. Only 13 people remembered. I want to thank the Lord that uh, when one man came down the aisle, God dealt with me that he's a man that's prayed. He's averaged 30 minutes of prayer or more in his life, and that was Otis Wells. I've told that uh, some different people, and uh, it's, uh, it is an encouraging thing to know that he's been faithful in his prayer life. I could tell it when he walked the aisle. It was encouraging. I sent word to the Richies tonight. I said, tell Nancy Eggleton. My mother said she was one that pledged herself to that very thing. 
Tell Nancy Eggleton that she was one. Tell her that I have the confidence that she's still praying at least 30 minutes a day. The word from God's servant was if those 44 people had prayed these 10 years, he told them this in 1975, if they had prayed 30 minutes a day, this church would have had 125,000 souls. We'd had a revival that resulted into 125,000 souls. Just 30 minutes of prayer of 44 people a day. Now, now what is our difficulty to get people? To, why, you know what the norm is? The norm is nominal Christianity. To try to get people to read the Bible, to pray, to witness, and to obey, and to, and to walk with God moment moment is as hard as trying to rescue a thief who's been a thief all of his life and stop trying to get him to be a thief. Now, God's able to do that, but it's, just, it's as difficult to rescue nominal Christians as it is to rescue a thief. Well, that's something, isn't it? I, I'm... Uh, it may be a little hard on you, but I, I, this is my experience. This is my experience. This is what I've observed. This is what I've observed, the tremendous downward pull on my own life. But oh, dear Lord, oh, in, in one sense, it's not, it's not a very hard thing to live, walk with God moment to moment, to have family prayer and, and to witness for Jesus and to acknowledge Him and to, and to read the Scriptures and to get to church regularly. But you just check up on your attendance record. Just, just go back through the years. Some of you would be awfully shocked to find out how many times you've missed church in one year. I mean, I'm not talking about your mission trips. I'm not, not talking about your trips to Israel. I'm just talking about the trips where you just had enough. You're just going to do it regardless. You just had enough. Got to take a break. I was thinking what I think I was thinking about what Pastor Wormbrand would have been like if he had just said, "Well, you know, I've had enough of communist prisons. I've been here two or three years. I'll just take a break." He couldn't take a break. Wasn't God's will for him to take a break. Never took a vacation in 13 years. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. The carnal nature would be awfully mad at me pretty soon. But uh, I, I, I'm, talking about a, I'm talking about a soldiering. I'm talking about a devotedness. I'm talking about a love for God that so grips the soul that, that, that this old, you see, when I came here, what was I fighting against? I was fighting against nominal Christianity. Brother, we could have a revival for a little while and people would praise God and get happy, but I would know that in two to three weeks they'd be in a backslidden condition. And then when I came along fresh in God and thrilled with the revelation of God, they would, they would back up on me, be aggra aggravated with me. Why? Because they simply backslid. How did they backslide? Didn't keep the essentials. How do you know? By the fruit. Fruit in my life, fruit in your life, fruit in anyone's life. I want you to know that the Apostle Paul was not a backslider. Amen. I want you to know that uh, what, what he talked about was living for Jesus day and night, walking with God moment by moment, and uh, you may not approve of his life entirely and his mode of singleness, but I want you to know that his attitude of heart has to be our attitude of heart. That, that devotion to Christ, that devotion to God and commitment to the will of God is the only way to the path of freedom. It's the only way to the joy in Christ. It's the only way to the good things of God. It's the only way for you and I to get what's coming to us in this life. You're right. We're due a lot of things, but we're not going to get it unless the carnal nature is slain in us. We're due. We have a great inheritance. We have great things planned out for us, but I want you to know every time you and I make a carnal choice, we block it, we stop it all together. Grasping for what we want, we lose everything that God has intended for us. Paul says, my gospel's different. <laughs> he said, my gospel is one where we have the mind of Christ. Think of what he wrote in the Philippian letter. He said, my gospel's one of having a, having a heart and mind like Jesus Christ has, had, even being a servant being a servant who did not grasp at his equality with God and was obedient even unto death. That's what his gospel is like. My gospel is a gospel that though it has many things in its pedigree and though it has many things that it could be counted uh, as having confidence in the flesh, he said, I count all those things as lost. In fact, I count them as rubbish. I count them as garbage. What? For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ to experience the power of the resurrection. To, to fellowship his sufferings. It's great. Yes, sir. That is marvelous and great. That's in the Philippian letter. That was in Paul's gospel. He wrote that right in Rome. Wrote that right down. And he, don't you tell me he didn't tell the Corinthian, I mean the, the Philippian, the Roman church. He told the, he told the Roman church. That great passage in, uh, in Colossians. And that's what I was getting to here and I got a little off, but maybe I wasn't off at all. Here he says, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. 
I said that Christ came in the world to, to effect an, a reconciliation between God and man. He came in the world to effect a reconciliation between man and man. You don't have to walk with each other long to know that you and I are in a war with each other. You don't have to walk with each other long to know that there's rebellion in the children, animosity between wife and husband, problems between neighbors, problems in church membership, problems with bankers, problems with lawyers, problems with all kind of things. Brother, there's a warfare going on. It's a rebellion constantly. Uh, but, uh, but Jesus came to dissolve that. Jesus came to, to, to uh, put an attitude in us that would let a man take our coat and our cloak. Uh, that would keep us out of suing people in the courts. Where, if at all possible, follow peace with, with all men, if at all possible. He, he'd put an attitude in us that would cause us through losing to win. Now you think of that. And would affect a reconciliation. But let me tell you something else. He did more than that. He gave us the power. He, take, he gave us the power to live what God demands, what God requires. And that's when writing to the Colossian church, also in prison, this is Paul's gospel, he said this great mystery, you can turn to it now, the great revelation, the great revelation is, uh, this is Colossians 1, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. For, for a thousand to two thousand years, uh, in the Mosaic economy, men thought that the, the glory of God was to be in the temple, was to be in the tabernacle in the temple. I tell you, this is news. He said the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, what, know you not that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Well, that was news to people. They thought the temple, uh, David wanted to make him a house. God said, I don't need one. Nathan said, I don't need a house. Right. He said, tell David, I don't need a house. Right. You can't put me in a house. Right. What he was looking for was the human heart. Right. You know, and when, and when, Calvary, when Calvary was affected, that barrier between God and man went down. And through the precious blood of Jesus, he entered the human heart. And he wants to dwell. That is, if we invite him there and let him be Lord of all, say, that's the mystery that's revealed. There's the power. Now unto him that's able to perform this work in you and bring it to completion. Where is the power? It's Christ in us. When that self is denied, as weak as we are, God's strength is made perfect in weakness because we just simply yield to him. And God comes in and does what no man can do by his own efforts. He lives within us and it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Say, this is great. This is Paul's gospel. And it's a full one, by the way. No one else ever said it. You try to read from Genesis to Revelation where anybody ever said the great mystery that's been hidden for so long that is now revealed is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Where is it ever revealed before? It's revealed. I know Jesus said the Holy Spirit shall be in you, but it was, it was Paul who said it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's where the power is. See, see how wonderful this is? This is his gospel. Now let me tell you this. I shared with you this morning uh, something I thought was, uh, was by comparison was most profound. When Jesus came, he came to reveal what God was really like. Um, no one had ever really seen the heart of God to this extent. Uh, God came down and gave us the Ten Commandments, but scared the life out of everybody. Uh, people about died. Some did die, I guess. Some got into a great panic. And I read it to you this morning. And all the people, this is while Moses was getting the Ten Commandments, all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they were moved and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his face may be before your faces, and that you sin not. That didn't make any difference. They were scared anyway. And the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near under the thick darkness where God was. A little laser, they came down and were uh, uh, worshiping the golden calf and, uh, and uh, 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 3,000 people were slain right there. Later on, 23,000 people were slain. Let me tell you something, they were scared. They were scared. They really didn't know what God was like. They knew what his wrath was like. But you know, contrast that now. Contrast that with the coming of Jesus where it is written by the Apostle John these wonderful and tremendous words. 
And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. They saw the glory, but the apostles saw the glory. But they saw something different than the children of Israel saw. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, full of grace and truth. Because of the blood of Christ, we drew near. Because of Christ's revelation, we found out what God was like. It wasn't as frightening and terrible. Oh, his wrath is terrible. And that is an aspect of his holiness. But let me tell you something. Jesus came to reveal the heart of God in love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believe him uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. Think of it right there. See, it's great. Oh, I hope, it, I hope I don't just sound like words I'm speaking to you. See, why well, they didn't have, they didn't have, they didn't ever, nobody had ever seen Matthew. Matthew hadn't been written. Mark hadn't been written. John hadn't been written. The only thing that had been written was Thessalonians and Galatians. That's all that had been written in the New Testament, perhaps a Corinthian letter or two. That's all there was when he wrote this letter to Rome. No gospels had been written. The gospel of Mark, the first gospel came later. So when Paul says, you'll be strengthened with my gospel and the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, he was saying a great thing. This is your, con this is your composition of strength. This is what I came to give to you. See, it's tremendous. You remember in the Ephesian letter how he tells about the middle wall of partition. Who ever had such a vision? The middle wall of partition being broken down between the Jew and Gentile and how God through the blood of Christ and through Calvary has made us one new man. See, we don't realize a tremendous division. You think there's division between Jew and Gentile now. How do you think it was 2,000 years ago? Far more pronounced. So much so that a man filled with the Holy Ghost like Peter didn't even know that we were invited by Christ to be a part of this one new man, of this new thing called the church. Well, isn't that great? Oh, it's great. Now, let me share this with you. The tenderness and the love revealed in Christ can be found in the writings of John. Look how he treated the woman from Samaria. She had several husbands. Look how he treated the woman f found in adultery. Look how he treated Zacchaeus up a tree. Went home with him. What was he doing? He was revealing the heart of God. Paul saw all that. He saw that himself. So Mark's gospel collaborated with, with his revelation. Paul's full gospel was reinforced by Mark when the gospels finally came into Rome. See what a tremendous thing it is? And then when it was written about in Luke, Luke, Luke was traveling along with Paul. When he got to Jerusalem, Paul was thrown in Jerusalem. He went over to see Mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, the mother of John Mark, and got to talking to the apostles to find out how these things were. He did his research, and while Paul was going through all this, Luke was writing it all down and wrote us the Gospel of Luke. Yes, That's where we learned about Zacchaeus, right, right there. Yes. Zacchaeus, why the people then didn't know that God loved tax collectors. They didn't know that God loved publicans. I want to be sure your children know the difference between publicans and republicans. It's liable to get mixed up. When I was little, I didn't know there was a difference sometime. I'd hear the word and think that was Republican. But you want to you help them to know the difference. God loved these men. These men who would not even be allowed to give testimony in a, in a, a, a court of law. Wonderful. Think of Matthew, who was a, who was a tax collector himself. I had a little vision in my heart once of Matthew being on those shores and watching Jesus go by and how that whenever Jesus came to his life, I believe his heart was one of the first to sing the verses uh, that was written several centuries later, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I tell you, it's a great thing. See, uh, Matthew saw how wonderful God was. Matthew saw how loving God was. I think we might think of it this way. I just learned, uh, we had an experience with Brian and uh, Tony. They brought home, a, what was the name of that beautiful bird? Cock cockatiel? Unusual bird. He brought home a cockatiel. And uh, <clears throat> he uh, wasn't fed properly. They, they went off to be somewhere, and uh, while they were off, he got sick, got in the bottom of the cage, scared us pretty bad. If you got someone else's pet and the thing gets sick on you, you're in a fix. And uh, we were in a fix, and we saw, I know enough about birds to know if they get off that perch and they get down in the bottom of the cage, something bad's wrong. So uh, this may sound a little funny to you, but you be encouraged. Uh, <clears throat> you, you may be there after a while, too. 
you know, I could let my own bird die or my own cat and dog, but I got somebody else's cat and dog or somebody else's bird on my hand. It's my son's, and they brought it home kindly as a gift between themselves, and they were going to have a nice time with this bird, and this bird's in the bottom of the cage, and I know this bird. I saw him just sitting up there with his feathers fluffed and knew that he was chill, and then he was in the bottom because I had canaries, you know, for a while, and um, so I said, Barbara, get on the phone and find a doctor. I don't want this bird to die on us. And he, how will we explain this bird is going to die on us? And so she got a hold of Dr. Gano up here. I guess one of the best bird doctors in this area. And we took the bird to the doctor and he uh, worked with it and tried to nurse it back to life and saw that it was, uh, had suffering from malnutrition, saw that it was chilled. And, and he said, I, I don't think I can do anything for it, but I will try. Well, in the night he died. Dr. Gano was a very precious man. He called me the next day and he said, uh, Reverend Hogue, he said, uh, Bertie was the bird's name. Bertie passed away in the night. Well, <laughs> I just had a funny feeling. It's like an undertaker called me about some person died. <laughs> Bertie passed away in the night. <laughs> when I speak about animals, I just say they died. But, uh, but uh, you know, but, but a doctor has to be careful because some people view their pets as important or more important than people. So they got to use nice language. Furthermore, a doctor cares. A veterinarian cares. He cares more about animals than I do. And I just learned, where did I hear about this doctor? Is this doctor some nice doctor? No, oh, yes, there's another doctor. Who's telling me about it? How he loved this. Uh, he, oh, somebody took their cat. And this doctor wept when the cat died. Who told us about that? Tom and Claudine Moore. They took their cat. Their doctor cared so much. He cared so much for animals that he wept. When their cat died, he wept. Well, that may sound a little strange, but if you get attached to a cat, and it's a dog or a cat you care for, you might weep a tear too because they're very personal. We don't want to, we don't want to be hard-hearted and make fun of people and not uh, listen to animals. It would be very important. Yes, Starve the bird. It was already hungry. It was already malnourished when Did they bought it. Anybody think that they had starved their own bird? No, they just had it a few hours. But where it was raised, it wasn't there. They raised them. They mass raised them. They didn't feed them enough. The doctor showed us his breastbone. Said, "See his breastbone out here. It's all caved in. That means he hasn't been fed right for some time." So no, it wasn't. No, thank you, Barbara. It wasn't them. Anyway. It's Tom and Claudine's doctor. And so here he was, so sympathetic with animals. And then he said, you know, and here is the essence of the story and pointing back to the, the, the revelation of this mystery. Uh, he said, you know, he said, uh, our, our greatest problem is with birds. He said, we can diagnose a bird. We know what's wrong with it. We can prescribe the treatment. He said, we can do all that. There's only one thing wrong. When I reach in to put my hand around the bird, the human hand shocks the bird so bad most of them die. He said, we know how to help them. We know how to die. We know, that, we know the diagnosis. We know the treatment. We know how to help them and how to get them well. But the problem is, when the human hand goes around the bird, the shock is so great that the bird dies. Now, that's something, the pro that's something of the problem that God had with us. When he gave us his law on Sinai, it scared us to death. All through the Old Testament, we'd just be frightened. And he had to find a way how to communicate with us. How could he set up this contact without putting his hands around us? You remember? And we, because we'd just die on God. Watch Manoah, the parents, uh, the, the parents of Samson. They thought they were going to die because the angel of the Lord appeared to them. How does, does this great, awesome God that created heaven and earth, you and me is in control of everything, how in the world does he effectively contact us without just us passing out, passing off the stage of action? i tell you how he did it. He did it through Jesus. He just came as a baby and he kind of grew up before we knew it. He kind of slipped in on us. I never said that before, but that's the way it was. He just kind of slipped in on us. There he was. Who's scared of a baby born in a manger? That wasn't the thunder and the lightning on Mount Sinai. He came up and he grew in favor with God and the man. 
But this one was God in flesh. And then as he walked among us, he was able to reveal what God was like. They watched him. They were amazed. Oh, there were some fearful moments, but they weren't the kind that scare you to death. Like when they caught all those fish and Peter said, depart from me, I'm a sinner, man. I'm a, I'm a sinner. Depart from me. See, that's great. Yes, it is. That's a wonderful reverence and a wonderful fear. But you see, God's problem was how to tell us what he was like without scaring us to death because if he put his hands on us, just shock us and we just die. He did it through Jesus Christ. Now, I thought it was a wonderful illustration. And Paul says, Paul said this gospel is that God has a heart of love for you. And when Jesus came, he re, being God in flesh, he revealed how wonderfully he cares for us, how tender he is, how gracious is the heart of God. Isn't it great? Now, this is the revelation. See, this is this great mystery reveal, what God is really like. Paul met him on the Damascus Road. He met him in a rather fearsome manner. But what won his heart was the love. Who art thou? I am Jesus, whom thou persecuteth. See, it's great. And as he walked with Paul and as he revealed to Paul, Paul was able, through his acquaintance through the gospel, directly with the Lord Jesus Christ, he was able to give us a fuller gospel than it ever had been given. Aren't you glad I elaborated on this a little bit? I, I could see with this little puzzle this morning. I had a great thing, but I couldn't tear loose on it. I just couldn't. I just wasn't able to do it. And, uh, but I want you to know it's something greater than what you thought. And for Paul to say to the Roman church, uh, uh, my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ is where your strength is. I want you to know there's more in here than you first thought. Look at, the, look at the book of Hebrews. Though it may not be authored by Paul, it is certainly Pauline. Look at the explanation of the sacrifices. Look at that great thing. Just, just remember, he explains this whole thing, what it's all about. And most are agreed that though it may not be authored by Paul himself, it certainly was the teaching of Paul. And so he says, but now is made manifest this wonderful mystery and by the scriptures of the prophets. Of course, we didn't know what the prophets were saying, but in the light of Christ's coming, we we're able to understand what Isaiah 53 was all about. In the light of Christ's coming, we're able to understand what Psalms 22, the crucifixion psalm, was all about. In the light of Christ's coming, we're able to understand Isaiah 61 as he came to heal the brokenhearted and to open the eyes of the blind. And then what happened? The whole Old Testament began to make sense, began to open up to us. See, isn't it great? But only in the light of his coming, when this mystery was revealed, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And then he says, and this is a part of his full gospel, God was making known to all the nations that he wanted their obedience of faith. Now, faith has in it implicitly, has in it believing, and believing has obedience. But you can see that he's distinguishing here between a true faith and a false faith. A true faith is one that has obedience to the will of God and to all the nations. Paul had a responsibility like no one has ever had, I think, before or since. I shared with you 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, and 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 and 6, but look at them real quick with me as I bring the, the closing part of Romans here. Oh, I could say a lot more. I, I've got a lot more in my heart, but I'm not going to, I don't believe I'm to talk too much longer. In, in 1 Thessalonians, he said, uh, 1 and 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only. Now, isn't that something? Not only in preaching. Not just the preaching. But my gospel's involved. But also in power and in the Holy Spirit in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples, so that you be could become a pattern for those that follow. And I think this great passage that he wrote to Timothy can't be left out. 15th verse of the first chapter of the first letter of Timothy. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern. That's Paul's gospel right there. 
seeing what God did in the life of Paul for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That's us. To them, that's us. But notice it says something there. Me first. Who's second? Who's third? Who's fourth? Who's fifth? Who's sixth? Who's tenth? Who's fifteenth? Who's twentieth? Somewhere down the avenue of 2,000 years, there is another who is a pattern. Now, he's not the first, but he's in apostolic succession. True apostolic succession. And if you watch the life of that apostle or those apostles, for there are several on the earth today. If you know who they are, he's Stanley Jones was one and he's died. You know, I thought how wonderful the Methodist church would be today if they had built their church upon the life of East Stanley with Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. Oh, I wish I could. I can't tell the Methodists that, but all you that are Methodists, you might want to tell the Methodists that. Read his books. I mean, it is an old-fashioned gospel. It's got, there is one, listen, his books of 20, 30 years ago and 40 years ago and 50 years ago and 60 years ago, just as vital today as the day he wrote them. Just pick them up and read them. I don't care where you get, Christ of the round table, Christ of the Indian road, whatever it is, I tell you, it is a gospel of power, a gospel of love, and it has a fuller understanding than most writers that are writing today. Been awfully good if the Methodist church had made him chief bishop. I know they tried to make him bishop and he turned it down, but I'm telling you one thing, my friends, he was the man to build the Methodist church on. After Wesley, I think the next great man was E. Stanley Jones. 200 years later, God gave him another apostle. His name was E. Stanley. Isn't it great? It's great. I'm so glad I thought of that. I know I'm right about this. I know it sounds strange, but I know I'm right. I know I'm right. There was a man in the church of God by the name of E. E. Byron. By God's wonderful grace, he was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have been better for the church of God to build their life upon him and his faith in Christ than to have built it upon a theology. Because Byram was God's servant. And whatever God told Byram, uh, that was the right thing. I, I, I am told that E.E. E. Byram objected to Anderson College becoming a liberal arts college. Well, I'll tell you something. If E.E. E. Byram objected to it, then I never would have had it. If God talked to E.E. E. Byram about Anderson College staying, now listen, I'm not tr preaching to the Church of God people. That's our background right here. So we're preaching to ourselves. But I'm telling you this, if I'd been with E.E. E. Byram and the Holy Spirit had said, I, uh, he said, I have a burden on that, I'm checked on that, I'd have gone that way rather, by, rather than by a Democratic vote. I'd have built my foundation on that. Is Lori in still here? She's right there. She's not frowning at me. Been better to go that way. A lot of us have been liberally educated and we just educated ourselves into idiocy. Most of us are educated idiots. We've got about as much sense as a zero when it comes to the true things of life and to the true things of God. That, oh, I know that's plain talking. I'm not after the Methodists. I'm not after the Church of God. I'm after us. <laughs> I do know that there's somebody in the second and somebody in the third place, somebody in the fourth place, and on down somewhere God's given us in every generation uh, those, someone, who's walking moment by moment with Christ. If we read their life and follow their gospel, it will harmonize with the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will harmonize. Because God's men are all that alike down through the ages. And if we build our life upon that foundation, you say, well, how can you build your church upon a man? Well, uh, that's the way it's built. When Jesus said, upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church, he wasn't saying, upon this philosophy, or upon this revelation, I'll build my church. That isn't anything to build anything on. There's nothing there. What is really there is the word of God in a man's heart, the revelation of Christ in a man's heart. So Paul was able to say that the foundation should be the apostles and the prophets. See, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Show me a church without men and you've got nothing. Show me paper and show me words and you've got no more than Buddhism's got. Jesus Christ is a person, not a written record. 
This is about him and his relationship with men. But, the, but Christianity is Jesus Christ and a relationship with him. This simply explains it. And it is the word of God. But if you, if you take away the central person of Christ, you've got no more. And, and I've heard Brother Ham say that over 90% of everything that's in here is in all other religions. What then, what then makes the difference? The difference is a person and a relationship with him and a relationship with those who have the full gospels, the, the apostles of Jesus Christ and the prophets and those that are walking with God. Well, you can, you can see why I was excited to get back to you tonight and explain this thing a little further. Now I wonder, Dad, do you feel, do you feel more enlightened on the subject? Praise God. Now you understand why Paul would say at the last part here, or maybe we do, he would say quite euphorically, to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. <laughs> oh, it's great. To God only wise. Only God has this wisdom, he was saying. Be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Do we know, Christians, what a wonderful heritage and a wonderful gospel that these men have given us. Are we willing to accept the full gospel? Are we willing to be the gospel? Because he said that we're to be in samples to the churches that are around us. Well, that's what God's trying to bring us to. I'm so thrilled tonight to, to have this, this time to amplify. I hope I haven't choked you to death. I, I've got a lot more to say, but we'll just have to chew on what we got here. And uh, I, think, I think just my opening remarks ought to have been enough to put you spiritually speaking in the floor to say there was two things in Rome that, that would be their strength. One was Paul's gospel and the other was the preaching of Jesus Christ. I think I'd chew on that a while. I'd say, now tell me about this. How can that be? Compound formula. See, I've tried to make it interesting this morning. Give you some choice words to think about. Well, I'll tell you, it's exciting by God's grace. I, uh, I have an increased desire to see the Apostle Paul. I'm waiting. I'm trusting it won't be too long until we can see him. You know what I got thinking about? I got thinking about washing his feet. I don't know if there's going to be feet washing in heaven, but maybe God will allow us to do that. And I thought one man, and it might be nice to wash his feet, would be Apostle Paul. More than nice. I'll tell you, I don't have hair long enough to wipe his feet like the woman did on Jesus' feet, but I'll grab something to wipe his feet. And I'm quite sure that I don't know what, if there's no tears in heaven, they're all wiped away, but uh, uh, I'm quite sure that whatever it is that's the equivalent of that, I'll be able to shed on his feet in appreciation and in love for the tremendous price that he paid to bring the gospel to you and to me. If it had not been for this full gospel, if it had not been for the Apostle Paul, we would have been cut off when the Jerusalem church was obliterated. That had been it. But because of this man and because of the Roman church, see there you'll never make fun of the Catholic church because it came right through there. The pristine church went right into the Catholic church and right through there came our gospel. So if you put down the Catholic church, you're in a fix. You're in a big fix. Doesn't mean everything went right. Everything's not right with any church today. If it was, the power would have already fallen. But I want you to know the gospel came right through Rome and you and I have reached the end of this letter and God has given us a precious treasure. Remember this. I've preached to you for two and a half years at the, at the leading of the Holy Spirit because God revealed. And I tell you, folks, I don't know where it's being done much on the face of the earth. But God had me do it, and I did. it's a difficult book uh, in places. But you know, God got us through. And we've preached to you. I trust that your dream is bigger and fuller and not so impossible that God can't make it possible in our lives. He has the power to do it.